Hey there, I'm Christopher Schoenwald, and welcome to Life as a, a show intently focused on helping people find their professional pathway by exploring and unearthing the details of jobs from around the world. There are a few school subjects in which the mere reference to them can invoke a myriad of emotions, often negative. So let's give it a go. I'm going to read off a few, and I'd like you to take notice of your own reaction. Ready? Here goes. Algebra. Calculus. Physics. Chemistry. How'd you fare? I mean, I could feel my own muscles tightening just reading some of those off. And for many, feelings of boredom or even stress could come to mind. But the reality here is that these topics, especially the science-based ones, cover fascinating matter that quite frankly links up with much of the exponential technological change we have witnessed in fields such as medicine and engineering over the years. Why is it that we think such subject matter to be either dull or overly intimidating? Well, our guest today has a few opinions on this. Not only that, she has endeavored to help reverse some of these negative connotations towards one particular subject, chemistry. Welcome to the show. So Dr. Colleen Kelly has created a chemistry comic book series filled with colorful characters and exciting storylines that translate complex chemistry into animated mysteries. Her comics and unique imagination have turned the periodic table into a playground of chemical adventure and have allowed elementary school students to master concepts often taught at the college level. Dr. Kelly herself is a chemistry instructor at the University of Arizona. She's also the creator and founder of Kids Chemical Solutions, which is a comic book-based chemistry curriculum, and in her words, intended for ages 8 to 108. Colleen's own journey as a chemist began at the University of Richmond, where she received her Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. There, she fell in love with the world of discovery and research and wanted to continue to explore more chemistry, so she headed to Penn State University and dashed through graduate school receiving her PhD in chemistry at the age of 24. And she was having so much fun doing chemistry research that she accepted a Chateaubriand postdoctoral fellowship in Strasbourg, France, with Nobel Prize winner Jean-Marie Len. Nowadays, Colleen finds herself captivated by the question, why do students think chemistry is so hard? And Dr. Kelly now conducts her research in chemical education to uncover this mystery. At present, she's engaged with teaching 4th and 5th grade elementary age students in Arizona using her chemistry comic book series. Her aim is to make learning chemistry fun, accessible, and inclusive so that it becomes a normal part of a child's education. So with all that stated, Dr. Kelly, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the program. How are you doing? Great. Thank you, Christopher. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited to get into this. I mean, your offering is so unique and obviously your background and all of your accomplishments as well. I think we're uh, we're primed for a nice talk here today. Um before we do begin though, would you prefer to to go by Dr. Kelly or shall I shall we No, to... please, Colleen. Yeah. It, it's inclusivity all around here today. <laughs> all right. Terrific, terrific. Well, why don't we get started? I do have the first segment lined up. It's something called Coloring Wikipedia. And as my listeners know, it's a segment where I read off a definition of the the guest profession, sometimes their industry as well. And it's just a nice launching pad into what the person does. And uh, I like it for a few different reasons. Like one in particular, you know, we we put our own stamp on our work. And although two or three people or 100 people could hold the same title, you know, we, we own it in different ways. So I think that unto itself sort of like offers a nice jumping off point into the discussion. And then too, I think it's just, uh, you know, sometimes these definitions on Wikipedia are spot on and other times they're just off. So I think, uh, you know, we can, we can get started just by doing that. So I have you down here for actually two definitions. I have one as chemist and one as an educator. So let me just read those off. And as you're listening, maybe you can just consider all that you've done, all you're currently doing and, you know, in the future, what you might be doing. And uh, we can revisit what your thoughts are after. Does it sound all right? Sounds great. All right. Well, here we go. First one is chemist. A chemist is a scientist trained in the study of chemistry. Chemists study the composition of matter and its properties. Chemists carefully describe the properties they study in terms of quantities with detail on the level of molecules and their component atoms. Chemists carefully measure substance proportions, chemical reaction rates, and other chemical properties. Okay. Very cold and sort of sterile definition probably there. (laughs) 
This second one, very, very general. I'm just going to forewarn you on educator. Let me read that out for you now. A teacher or educator is a person who helps students to acquire knowledge, competence, or virtue by the practice of teaching. So there we go. Two definitions. What What are your okay. first uh, thoughts on them? I think when you were reading the chemist, I thought, wow, do I do that? <laughs> it's a little surprising. I mean, when you dissect it, of course, the components are there. But um, in your words, it is very sterile. Um, I think one thing that is, um, you know, overemphasized maybe through media and, you know, television and things like that is this, um, you know, precision and sterile and, you know, um, you know, attentive to detail and, very um, rigidity. And in fact, chemists are the most imaginative people I know because we have to see the world of the invisible. And oftentimes in our discovery process, we're playing. And so I think what's lacking from that description is the playfulness and the imagination mm. that we bring to the table. Um, there's a, a material called graphene that was discovered in 2000, um, I think 2004 and won the Nobel Prize in 2010. And it was discovered because on a Friday afternoon, a couple of chemists put a piece of scotch tape on uh, basically the tip of a pencil and mm. because they were playing around and then they put that under a microscope. So um, I would add to that that I have enjoyed being a chemist because of the playfulness, the imagination, the what happens if I do this instead of this careful, precise measurement. And also um, the first time my parents saw my lab at Penn State, they were horrified because they expected to see everything white and it, it's a mess <laughs> I, you know so there's there's slime and goop and dunk and yeah. dirty glassware yeah. it looks like you know anyway it, it, it's not that at all so um we're messy we're fun we're imaginative and playful yeah, I love that. I, I really, really appreciate that sort of angle on it all because you're right. I mean, like that is the stereotype. And like, as, as I was reading off that definition, those were the exact sort of images I had within my head, you know, that that white sort of like the lab coat, the the sterile sort no. of room, like every, everything just being like perfectly <laughs> lined up, you know, like, but no. I, I love that notion of play, you know, and, and creativity. Those are words that you don't often hear associated with science and let alone chemistry. And uh, I, I think just by attaching that to it it really opens up the world of possibilities for people when considering it all you know there, there's so many interesting things that can be dis discovered there i mean it's still such an area that you know probably within the scope of things we still know so very little about really you know so yeah i really really appreciate that i like that all right in terms of i guess you know the definition would be there would there be anything else you'd like to add to it or even subtract perhaps um, I, no, I think, I mean, what I, what I added was, was, you know, the creativity and the imagination that's required. Um, and chemists, yeah, actually I, I would add chemists have to see the world of the invisible. Mm. Um, we can't see atoms or molecules. So every day in our lives, we are imagining molecules dancing. So chemists see the world of the invisible. They see the exchange between certain molecules. They see electrons traveling. So well, when I say see, we see that in our imagination. So um, we spend a lot of time in the world of the invisible. And I think that's what makes the, the subject matter. So um, I guess inaccessible at first is because right. you can't see it yeah yeah okay I mean, in terms of a, I guess a typical day for you right now I mean we're going to get into it later with the kids chemical solutions I'm sure that's taking up a, a bit of your time <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I understand that you are still teaching you know uh, not only young children but uh, university students as well so maybe you could right. shed a little light on uh, the different hats that you're wearing right now Right. So mainly um, I'm an instructor, which means that I teach um, college level chemistry classes. So um, I teach a lot of times I teach the students who are taking a class called organic chemistry. Yeah. So I um, just roll into a lecture hall of about 200, 300 students. And uh, I always start the class with a story and a story relevant to that day, what we're going to talk about. And we also have some warm up activities where they're um, solving some puzzles. And I like to call them puzzles because problems is very negative. And so puzzles means yeah. fun, problems means we've got an issue. So <laughs> we're puzzle solvers in my class. Um, 
And then we go into explanations so, um, of the topic and we have, you know, a rotating routine of puzzle solving, playing, discussion, and back mm -hmm. again. So that's um, the beginning of my day. Usually I teach in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then the afternoons, I um, direct the laboratories that the students are in. So I walk around between all the different laboratory sections and, you know, make sure the um, experiments are going well and that, that they're having fun. It's really important to me that they are having fun. So um, I would say my number one um, important, I guess, the thing top on my list is safety because yeah. that's really important. <laughs> and then after safety <laughs> is fun. And then if they're having fun, they're learning. So I know the two go hand in hand. Yeah, excellent. Well, forgive me. We did we didn't revisit the uh, we didn't revisit the the definition of educator, but I think in your explanation there, it just sort of you know captured that. You know, I like your approach in terms of what you're describing there is is trying to make it accessible to people by opening up with stories, puzzles, things that are gonna like pull people in rather than sort of push them away. Like here's the problem right. that we have to go after. Like, and then yeah. that's where the, the the educator side comes in is trying to make things you know presentable in a manner that it's going to one capture somebody's interest or attention and then not only that sustain it and hold it moving forward so you have these two different worlds which are really interesting you have the the pure science side of it but then also too you're trying to connect with people and uh you know and allow this this information to be digested by them for them to come up with their own conclusions i suppose as well so yeah indirectly right. i think we uh we addressed the uh the definition <laughs> i'm sorry for uh <laughs> for not uh, asking about that's that. okay <laughs> yeah excellent all right. Well, maybe we could skip on over into another segment. And uh, this is a segment called Pathways. And the idea behind this segment here is that, from my experience, at least, typically, a lot of people don't have this straight linear path, you know, like, this is the job that I want when, you know, when you're in your teens or in your 20s, like, this is the path that I'm on. And ultimately, I'm going to end up here. And it's just a straight line. Oftentimes, there's, you know, zigging and zagging, left turns, right turns, you name it. I'm wondering here, though, whether or not you might be a bit of an exception. You know, maybe that <laughs> this was something that you had your eye on from a young age and you just went, you beelined it right towards, you know, the, the profession you ended up in. Maybe uh, you could shed some light on this for us. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. Yes and no to that question. I'm a first mm. generation college student, so I had no mentoring um, for going to anything in higher education. Okay. So, um, as a, you know, as a child, I read a ton and I read mysteries and I loved solving puzzles through mysteries okay. and solving the mystery. I didn't have chemistry kits. I didn't have any kind of science mentoring. Um, my dad was an insurance agent. My mom worked in a nursing home. So, okay. um, you know, it was yeah. just kind of regular things going on. Um, but I hit chemistry in high school and really liked the solving the puzzles and working through everything that was given to me. I really just enjoyed it. So there was no intent. I just followed my joy. I didn't beeline to anything. I just stayed on my joy. Okay. And um, I do laugh because I uh, still friends with a lot of my friends from high school to this day. Yeah. And they're all thankful for me for doing their chemistry homework for them in high school. So <laughs> I, I, I'm I telling you, I could have used you in my high school <laughs> class, in my high school chemistry class. I'll tell you that right now. They always, they always yeah. grab my hand and say, I don't know what we would have done without you in high school. Yeah. So, yeah. And I also yeah. taught. So I think I had a joy for the subject. I had a joy for working the problems, the puzzles. And I also had a joy for teaching my friends. So okay. it was all kind of organic that it was coming together when I went to college, um, it was just a class that I took and continued to enjoy it. And it really, Christopher, the whole time I was just following my joy. I had a research research mentor at the University of Rich Richmond who um, suggested that I go to graduate school because she said, you mm. seem to really enjoy research and you're having fun. Do you want to go to graduate school? I didn't even know what that was. Mm. Um, and so I just said yes. So a lot of my career path was just saying yes um, yeah. when people presented me with opportunities that seemed to align with what my joy was. So okay. um, when well, sorry I to interrupt here, 
sorry yeah. to interrupt when you were in high school was did you have some ideas that were sort of taking shape that like well maybe i could see myself doing something like this down the road if you can recall was, were, were ideas like that sort of like floating around or was it still at that a little bit i think i want i think i thought i wanted to be actually my my parents suggested because they saw some of this and the closest career they could think of was a pharmacist so mm. they thought well maybe you should be a pharmacist you seem to like this and they said okay, okay. But I didn't go to a university that had a pharmacy major, so <laughs> okay. I, I took that off the there. table. I'm yeah. like, well, what else is there? If there's not pharmacy, so uh, chemistry came right in there. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. All right. Well, it's, it, it, yeah, it sounds interesting in the sense that, like, I think it, at least from an outsider's perspective, that maybe that that pathway was there, and maybe you just didn't fully realize it at the time, but you were just sort of like being guided along, maybe through your own just interests and you know gentle nudges from different people along the way. Um, really quickly, again, I'm going back to this high school point one more time. Was there you know a, a teacher perhaps there that was encouraging, or the way that the the matter was being presented was appealing to you? So you know, absolutely, people, yes, yeah, yeah. For most people, that that is a bit of a, a sore point. You know, it's a tough one in in high school. Like this this information, the way it is presented, oftentimes is quite complicated and uh, and difficult for a lot of students. You know, myself included. I can recall as I said often, <laughs> in the intro you know I could feel my, my, my muscles just tighten up as I'm you know, <laughs> reading this off it's so but, common uh, oftentimes like yeah yeah like I think that can be one of the ways that you know softens all of this is is having an educator who sort of you know introduces it in a different way maybe maybe in a way that appeals to you in like this the sense of puzzles and, and finding solutions to some of these things um, maybe you could comment on that really quickly yeah, it, it definitely was my high school chemistry teacher. Uh, I was a, a swimmer in high school and I would come from morning swim practice right to first period chemistry. Mm -hmm. So my hair would be wet and I still have goggle marks around my eyes. And, uh, you know, he would come up to me, his name is Mr. Carr, I still remember, and say, do you have gills? <laughs> <laughs> and and it was the first teacher that probably ever spoke to me, I was incredibly shy um, very much an introvert. And, um, but I think he saw that I was really enjoying what was happening in the class and devouring it really. And, um, yeah. but also the way he would present things uh, when electrons skip different levels, they, they become energized. Um, I still remember he did this high jump onto the, onto his desk show to demonstrate how much energy it takes for an electron to jump levels. And I thought, whoa, like I could, I can't even jump over a curb and here this guy's jumping on a desk. So he has this very animated presence. But also what I gathered from that is that you have to perform. It, chemistry is tough and we can't see it, but that jump to show how much energy it takes for an electron to go from ground level to what we call an excited state. And he did that. And I thought, wow, that is a lot of energy. And now I can start to see it myself. So um, as someone to teach chemistry and for students to get it, there's things that you need to do and you have to get out of your comfort zone a little bit and be a little bit of a performer. Mm. Oh, that's nice. It's nice well, to hear nice. That, nice. Uh, that, that you had somebody like that that was able to package up that information in such a way that it could capture imagination and, and interest. Because I know for others, it, it doesn't always go that way. So <laughs> no. I know that's a, a discussion point we're going to get into soon. So maybe we could shift on over with this in mind into another segment. We kind of just continue this back and forth. It's a Q&A discovery. Okay. And I off the top, I did introduce, you know, listeners to this idea that, you know, one of the things that fascinates you is this this notion of what makes chemistry so incredibly, you know, difficult in people's minds. And it's it's the question that you're you're searching for an answer and sort of led you to what you're doing right now, your present day with uh, Kids Chemical Solutions. So maybe in some of your research, you could uh, shed some light on this answer. I found it really quite compelling when I was uh, researching this talk. Uh, yeah, I, I still find it compelling. I think part of it, Christopher, was because I was a first generation college student without any science background. I, we didn't have science at home. Um, and then, you know, as I was successful going on through, you know, my PhD and then my postdoc and then a faculty position, I, I really didn't understand that other people thought it was hard because I was surrounded by chemists. So mm -hmm. 
1995, I step in front of my first organic chemistry class and there's 200 students. And I thought this is going to be the best ever. Like I love <laughs> organic chemistry more than anything. And they're going to love it too. And we're just going to have so much fun. And I it was like, <laughs> I, I couldn't wait to run into my first class. And they're looking at me like I'm the female Darth Vader that just like walked <laughs> through. I was going to put them from their dreams and, and, yeah. you know, all these horrible things that were going to happen in this class. And so I realized a, they didn't like it as much as I did. Well, and then I realized B, almost no one does. Um, and then C, <laughs> that um, that they really thought it was hard. And and I kept thinking, I, I, I'm not brilliant. I don't understand why I can, I can get this mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. can't. Like I didn't mm-hmm. come from wealth. I didn't come from privilege. What happened in my brain that's not happening in yours? And so that's just a really fundamental question. And I think had I not had my background, I maybe I wouldn't have been as curious. But I knew it wasn't just hard work. I knew it was something else. So I've spent the last 25 years trying to figure out what's going on. And what I realized is the key that I hit on earlier is the imagination piece. And um, in order to do well in chemistry, specifically organic chemistry, you need to be able to interpret symbols so that they become a language and that you have this fluency with these symbols um, so that not only can you see them in your imagination, you can draw them, you can write them. So it is a completely different language. And in the last year or two, I've uncovered that the neural pathways involved in learning chemistry are more like learning music than any other, uh, especially there's no connection with mathematics um, for this particular branch. So the interpretation of musical symbols uh, musicians can look at a, a sheet of music and hear it, right? Yeah, Even though there's yeah. no sound. Um, organic chemists look at, you know, a bunch of, um, we call them mechanisms on a whiteboard and we see the movement. Mm. And so it's very similar. So we know the best time to teach um, humans music is between, you know, starting about six, seven or eight years old when their brains mm. have the plasticity yeah. to get yeah. that same with foreign languages. So through my research, we now know that that is really the best time to teach chemistry. And what happens in the United States is we keep pushing the bar further and further back. So we keep delaying learning chemistry, sometimes even till college. And can you imagine going to, to college as a music major and never have read any music and saying, well, I want to be, I want to be in a symphony and here I am. Right, and right. that's what's happening with our, our STEM students in college. They may say, I'm going to go to be a doctor, um, but never had really the depth of training required yeah, to take yeah. these classes at that level. That, that, that research is a complete game changer, you know, if, if it can be applied in the right way. I mean, that, that really right. opens things up, you know, like it, it's just that because when you are encountering it later in life, like you said, and you're learning a language perhaps, or trying to learn music later in life, we can all sort of like relate to that sort of notion, or at least understand that that could be an incredible challenge. And having a research to kind of back up this point that chemistry operates in the same way, at least neurologically speaking, you know, if we can apply that and and build it into our educational systems at these earlier ages, you know, that that's where that sense of imagination and play and everything yeah. else is going to come. It's going to be derived from that, which kind of leads into my next question. And I think we're answering it right here, but maybe we could uh, just take it a little bit further. You know, I'm guessing a lot of this is where the inspiration for Kids Chemical Solutions came along, you know, in terms of the characters, in terms of the comic book series, but maybe we'd launch into all of that right now off the heels of this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, these these stories have been brewing within me for decades, starting with that very first class that I described of organic chemistry students when I realized I had to connect with them. They were not seeing what I, even if I was drawing something on the whiteboard, they weren't interpreting as anything meaningful. So instead I said, all right, well, instead of fluorine, what if you, you think of fluorine like piglet? And what if you think of bromine as Winnie the Pooh and like piglets mm. clingy and is going to hold on and not yeah. leave. And, you know, bromine or Winnie the Pooh is big and puffy and going to wander off and, and then 
there's something called a leaving group. I'm like, which is the better leaving group? Oh, bromine is a better leaving group. So um, I just had to start telling these stories. And mm. as juvenile as they were, they were sticking. And I was just picking from anything. I was a young mom at the time. So I had plenty of <laughs> youthful animated stories to pick from. Uh, a lot of Shrek analogies came up during these awesome. years. <laughs> um <laughs> So I would pick from whatever I had available to me just to make this connection. Um, so fast forward, I started writing these stories in my own characters with my own visions and trying to get them published and really struggling, you know, that struggling author story. I've got, I also have the 300 rejection letters. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I realized they were too dialogue heavy. They weren't, it wasn't working. And, um, the only medium that I could think of to translate these into that was dialogue heavy was a comic book. So I had to, you know, bootstrap my lesson, look on YouTube, look on the internet and figure out how to write a comic book script and then take it from there. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. I mean, I've seen some of the uh, the imagery that you sent across, of course, and uh, just my own research on, on what you've been doing. And uh, it, it's quite engaging. And I encourage everyone to go check out this conversation on YouTube. I will reference that later on as well. But you'll be able to see some of the imagery and some of the characters that, you know, Colleen has created that uh, that presents the matter in just a, a whole different way. It's, it's again, I, I kind of brings us uh, this, this notion of game changer to mind. I know I've already referenced that once, but I think it really is. If you can put it in front of kids at this younger age and put it in, in, in the story format, which unto itself, there's been a lot of studies on, you know, how our brains operate and how we interpret information through the usage of stories and how effective that can be. And you combine all these things up and there's, you know, a lot of possibility there. So yeah, it's really, really quite exciting. Yeah. Um, I guess in terms of some of these characters within the, the comics themselves, you know, I understand that you build in notions of inclusivity within the characters themselves as well. Maybe you could comment on that, too. Yeah. So um, the main characters, Poppy and Ray, Poppy for polonium, Ray for radium, they represent mm -hmm. elements. So they're green because they're radioactive. But I, I am mindful of each character representing the element or molecule that they are uh, that they are representing. But within that, um, even if they're human-like, they don't have human-like skin. We have a lot of green skin, pink skin, blue skin. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of flippers on the bottom and, um, you know, two heads on top. Yeah. <laughs> um, we They're very uh, Seuss-like, Dr. Seuss-like mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, and I think when I reflect upon that, the beauty of that is nobody looks like them. Mm -hmm. So everybody looks like them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's a twofold approach. The, the first approach really was to make sure that the character really was a great representation of that element or molecule. Yeah. And then when I take took a step back and I, I wanted to work in the world of inclusivity, I thought, well, most of them don't have a gender. Um 90 some percent of them don't have a gender mm -hmm. and they don't have a race or ethnicity ethnicity either um and i think that is then you know if these guys yeah. came to a table this is a very diverse group of creatures <laughs> and really that's what they are is they come out to be just creatures yeah no, excellent excellent now in terms of the reaction that, that the series is generated within you know from well from a learner standpoint but then also some of the like the the practitioners people that are putting this in front of youth you know what, what's been the reaction like well i'm working with the fourth graders and the fifth graders firsthand and having a blast yeah. and um they're amazing uh, uh today we started the second book, which is file to the case of the missing atomic model. And um, I handed out the comic books and they have reading guides and they have their activity workbooks with it that um, also come with the purchase of the comic book. Yeah. And um, I, I heard one girl go, oh, there's MC. MC is one of the main characters. There's MC. We've missed you, MC, because they had a little <laughs> break. And so the um, kids love series with characters that come back because it's a familiar familiarity comfort mm. and you know i get um comments from them afterwards well first of all they don't want to stop the bell will ring and they're like one more page i'm like no mm. you guys you have know, to get to your next win. class yeah yeah, yeah you know, one more page and i had one little guy come up to me and he kind of grabbed my arm and said dr kelly 
where can I get more of these? <laughs> and I said, well, we're going to be reading them in class. So, you know, we'll, we're going to get through these so you can have as many as you want. Um, yeah. So the feedback is really great. Um, they're hunched over. They love reading it aloud to each other. For me, because I'm a, an avid reader and I have that joy of reading, I'm almost as excited about their joy of reading as I am about what they're learning in chemistry. Yeah. Probably, yeah, if it's 50-50, that would be a tough call. Um, in their reading guides, they have vocabulary words to write down on the right-hand side, that I, things that they see that they don't know the meaning of so that we can yeah. go back and, and look at that. And today I'm wandering around and I see, oh, quantum mechanics. They're like, what's quantum mechanics? I'm like, these are nine-year-olds. It's great. Yeah, you know, yeah, right? It's a good right. time for their vocabulary to expand. And um, so I asked them, what do you think it is? Well, I think it has something to do with computers because it's, you know, said anyway. I'm like, yeah. So it it has been phenomenal working with these little guys in that. And I, I hope that the practitioners will have the same experience. Right now, I've got homeschoolers working with it, so I don't. It's not in the classroom yet because I want it to myself pilot it in a classroom, so mm -hmm. that um, I'm not handing something off to a classroom teacher that's not ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think off the top, I'd mention this as well, and you know, I cover this in in researching for this talk that some of the the material that you are presenting to them is actually of the age of like what college level students would be oh absolutely and I guess like the question like they're like quantum me mechanics for an eight or nine year old right, like yeah. it might sound almost jarring for a listener right now but it, it's really really quite compelling to hear that you know the content itself is being packaged up in such a way that it is accessible that there is the possibility of introducing some of the subject matter at such a young age and again with that research that you're alluding to just a few few moments ago it would make sense to to start introducing it at these younger ages uh, maybe you'd comment on that a little bit too right yeah I, I think what I've uncovered is if we can revolutionize science education so that chemistry becomes something in elementary school imagine then what we can do in high school and college Right. We can really raise the bar. So um, I say we're going to lower the bar to accessibility, make things more accessible so that we raise the bar in learning and education and chemistry. And uh, we really do need to raise this bar. We shouldn't be teaching um, the number of protons, neutrons and electrons in an atom in college. Um, I just had 25 fourth graders just crush it in like and they're like can we do another one okay let's do another one and they raise their hands so violently that I feel like they're gonna their shoulders are gonna come out of their sockets <laughs> you know because they they want to be called on so yeah it um I I think what we what we can do is just change this model so that as we go on and become um a nation that's more you know more comfortable with science and the sky's the limit then yeah, excellent. Well, in terms of this last question within the segment itself, I mean, I can kind of gather what you might say, but I still like to hear it anyway. You know, what what is this journey meant to you as far as reward and you know personal sort of reflection on on a lot of your accomplishments to this point, and especially the most recent stuff with you know Kids Chemical Solutions and this comic book series. You know, maybe you could comment on that as well. Yeah, I I think it it's it's been. It's shown me how much, how important it is for me to understand how people learn chemistry. And at this point, this is, um, it's like breathing to me how important it is that we make this change. So this is, I've checked all my boxes, Christopher, you know, I got tenure, blah, 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 whatever, yeah. published, yeah. rah, 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 did some research. Um, yeah. But this has become even more important to me because of what I've seen over the last 25 years. Great, great students, phenomenal young people, and one failure in college chemistry and their life has changed. They feel different about themselves. It, it's crushing. And I, I don't mean to, that that is not a trivial statement. It is crushing. Mm -hmm. And I really want to stop that. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that too. And I think, you know, what comes to mind in, in having this conversation and then researching it is that you're kind of showing or modeling a different approach to this whole world of, of science. You know, we, we spoke about this lightly off the top, you know, like it doesn't have to be just this white lab coat in this pristine lab. Like there's so <laughs> many other possibilities out there for 
other people, you know, it, it's inspirational in that sense too. Like here we have this sort of like entrepreneurial sort of path that you're seemingly on as well. And elements of creativity being built into it and, and taking, you know, a world that's only viewed or by many people viewed in one way and shifting it and changing it and transforming it into something else. And, uh, you know, I think that breeds a lot of different possibilities for others who can kind of do the same thing, maybe take an idea that you're working on and shift it, you know, culturally, perhaps and do something with it. Like, I, I just I love this idea of how we're shattering this image of what a stereotype might be or of what a lot of people hold for this world of science itself so i think that that must offer some degree of reward as well and then the second point that sort of like struck me is that maybe you were just sort of alluding to this as well is that the notion of of scalability on this like in terms of impact you know you can really if, if you're able to to get this into to educational systems stem programs like this is a game changer. Like you said, like you, you can really change people's life trajectory on some of these things, you know, where they, they're entering these classes once they get to college with the degree of confidence that they can achieve. And uh, yeah, that, that's going to serve that person individually. But on scale, that's also going to serve humanity, you know, and, and culture itself, right. too. So I, I could see like a, a several different points of reflection along that journey being quite rewarding, <laughs> potentially. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah, you're definitely on. And I think, um, you know, often on Sundays, my dad will call me with the New York Times crossword puzzle. He always asks me the science question, right? And I never get it right. He doesn't understand why <laughs> I went to all this school and why I don't know what the answer to every <laughs> New York Times, Times crossword, crossword yeah. puzzle in science. <laughs> it's like a running joke in my family. Um, <laughs> but to that end, I, I wish my, you know, my own family, I wish my dad could look at his medications and know okay, well, this means this, and that means that, or, you know, if um, I'm looking at shampoo, you know, what's the difference between this shampoo or this shampoo? Should I pay more for that? So there, there is some citizenship aspects of understanding chemistry that really can help humanity and not at the level of making it a career, but just mm. making good choices for yourself and understanding it. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. All right. Well, on that uh, on that note, maybe you can shift over into this middle segment, something called a water cooler story segment. And here I just ask guests to indulge the listeners with a story related to their profession. I know you've already shared a couple today, but uh, I'd be curious to hear if you have anything else for us. Yeah, I would just like to share with listeners a little bit more about my journey. Um, when I was a freshman in college, I had a, a good friend. She's still a good friend. Um, say to me, you should do research. And again, I, I didn't know what research was, had no idea. And, and, and my first piece of advice would say yes to as many things as you can. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. know that's counterintuitive, but I would say, say yes to as many things as you can to your 40 and then back off, but <laughs> somewhere around there, <laughs> but certainly at, at 18, say yes. So I said, oh, I said, that sounds like a good idea. How do I even begin that? And she said, well, you need to find a professor and ask them to do research. So I had seen this young woman, she was a new faculty member at the University of Richmond, and she drove this really spiffy um, antique Mustang convertible. And I thought, okay, nice. she looks cool. I have no yeah, idea yeah. who she is or <laughs> what research is. So in the old days before email and, and cell phones, I just sat in front of her door. I found her office and just sat there for the day and did homework and I went to class, came back, sat in front of her door again and figured eventually she's going to show up at her office mm -hmm. so I could talk to her. <laughs> and she did. And there I was on the floor and I stood up and I just said, I would like to do research with you. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as that. And I think we overcomplicate opportunities in life. It's as simple as asking. And mm -hmm. I've I fast forward at the University of Arizona. If I have a student in my class or my lab that I find is particularly gifted or interested, I say, would you like to do research? And they give me the same look. They never thought of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I have um, 60 graduate students who work for me as well. So I usually pair them with a graduate student and say, here, here's a nice match. You guys go do research. And it, it's mm -hmm. simple. And I think yeah. we overcomplicate this, which direction should I go? Just yeah. go with someone who's friendly and something that's somewhat interesting and see where it happens. And that's what happened to me. That's a really good point. You know, really, really valuable point, I think, for youth when they're you know, considering all these different options. You're right. I mean, it doesn't have to be as complicated as what you think it could be. It's just 
you know, opening up your world to possibilities, what you think, you know, isn't oftentimes the actual, you know, reality of it all, you're going to uncover so much more, or you might even prove false some of the ideas or notions that you had about something. And that again, will open up your world to, to so much more. So yeah, I really like that story. It's a, a really nice reminder for anyone, I think, especially youth in particular. So yeah, excellent. Well, maybe we can shift into this very last segment, a crystal ball segment. And as the name implies, we're looking to, you know, trends, predictions, so on and so forth relating to the future. And we already spoke about this lightly, but in terms of your vision for Kids Chemical Solutions, in terms of getting this, you know, in front of more young people, in particular within STEM programs, maybe you could comment um, on, on some of this as well, some of your visions for things moving forward. Yes, definitely. So the comic book series is 10 comic books that we have planned um, that will be published and they scaffold the learning objectives found in an introduction to chemistry at a college level or maybe a, a senior level in high school. So that is one, I call that product the heavy lifter, like that's going to do all the teaching, that's got the worksheets, the activities, the games, the puzzles, um, all kinds of fun stuff, the reading guide. So all the learning can happen on that platform, but we also have planned an animated series and the animated series is going to be the hook. So we can't pack all that learning into an animated series. No one will watch it other than me probably. So I know that, <laughs> um, but we can take these characters and animate them and have parallel and complementary lessons. Um, maybe not the exact same stories, but um, similar stories. And I think it would be like what Sesame Street was to counting and reading or knowing the alphabet. So we can have an animated series that will grab learners of all ages. Um, and then uh, and then along with that, a gaming platform. There's um, a lot of things that can go along with gaming. So we can have a gaming platform so that as you're reading the comic books, um, there's also then games you can play, whether it's through a gaming system or just an app. Wow. Wow. That sounds also exciting. Really quickly, were these ideas that you sort of organically just sort of came up with along the way? Or was this sort of like once you started putting the idea out there, you'd have others that were kind of like getting interested or curious about it and being like, well, hey, you should try this or you should try that. Has it been, you know, internally sort of like these ideas where they've been coming from? Or has it been sort of a, a mix between the two? I would say it's a mix between the two. I would say the animated series came about when I realized when you're trying to make something like this, um, make this paradigm shift in the way that things are taught, the best way to do it is to create an animated series that teachers could watch. And then all of a sudden, then, you know, my characters, I have this great blue oxygen character named Big Ox, who's this jolly big ox, is super cute and funny. You know, then he's on a t-shirt at Target. And it becomes very normal. They're They're on, you know... There's, you know, you could dress up like Poppy and Ray for Halloween. So mm. that only comes from an animated series. And then you can get back into the heavy lifting of the learning from the comic books. Yeah. So I, I, it's almost out of necessity that I realized that I would have to have an initiative in the world of children's media. Yeah, but it's also a, it's an a accessibility lot of people. point, right? Sorry, yes. to interrupt there. It's, it's, it's an accessibility yeah. point is what it is. It's at least what it sounds like to me. It kind of like hooking people in perhaps like you, that, that word that you used and then allowing them to kind of, you know, use that as a gateway into the, the deeper content itself. Right, so, right. Yep. Yeah. So and a lot of people have been, you know, helping me and pointing me in directions of of how to do that and why it's a good idea. So I had the kind of the gentle notion, but definitely others have helped me with that as well. Yeah. Well, it sounds also exciting. And I must say, Colleen, like we've just flown through this conversation. I have a billion more questions I could ask you, but I'm <laughs> conscious of your time. So I, I am really thankful for you uh, deciding to take some time and join the program today. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Well, for those interested in learning more about Colleen and her work, of course, you can find her on LinkedIn and also at kidschemicalsolutions.com. And for reference, the information, these links will be in the actual show notes. And also too, I mean, if you like today's show, please be sure to share, you know, get these ideas out there. The more people know about them, you know, the better. Yeah, I think we can expose different uh, you know, ways of thinking towards things, ways of tackling problems, or just, you know, this notions of creativity and what we were speaking about on today's program. And of course, of course, you can rate, review, 
and subscribe wherever you access your podcasts. And I did mention this earlier, but head on over to YouTube within the last year. I did launch a channel over there and we will have the video conversation we had today with Colleen. And I will have some imagery associated with this talk. So again, you'll be able to check out some of these characters that Colleen has dreamt up and uh, and get a better feel for it all. So if you do head over there, you know, this, this uh, channel is new. So yeah, uh, hit that subscribe button and really appreciate that. And lastly, please don't forget to tune into the next episode of Life As A, where we'll continue to explore and unearth the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Until next time, stay curious about life and learning.